When you hear the word climate, you might imagine global warming or natural disasters. But in geography, we begin by understanding something more fundamental, how air, water, temperature, and pressure work together to shape the weather we experience daily and the long-term climate of a place. In topic one of the climate cluster, we explore four main areas, what weather and climate mean, why air temperature varies, why precipitation patterns differ across places, and how wind direction and speed are influenced by global and local factors. And most importantly, you'll learn how to apply this knowledge in your O or N level geography examinations. Let's begin with the fundamentals of weather and climate. Weather refers to the state of the atmosphere at a specific place and time. It includes variables such as air temperature, cloud cover, precipitation, wind speed, and wind direction. These are short-term conditions that can change from hour to hour or day to day. On the other hand, climate describes the average state of the atmosphere over a much longer period, typically over 25 years or more. It helps us understand the prevailing conditions of a place based on long-term patterns. There are different climate types found around the world. For instance, the tropical equatorial climate found in countries like Singapore and Cuba is characterized by high mean annual temperatures of around 27 degrees Celsius, small annual temperature range of less than 5 degrees Celsius, and high total annual rainfall exceeding 2,000 millimeters, with precipitation occurring evenly throughout the year. The tropical monsoon climate, seen in places like Bangladesh and India, also has high temperatures but shows clear distinct wet and dry seasons throughout the year. Finally, the cool temperate climate, such as that found in London or Paris, experiences four distinct seasons and has a lower annual rainfall between 300 and 900 millimeters. For your examinations, you may be asked to describe or compare these climate types. Be sure to include specific temperature ranges, rainfall patterns, and named examples when crafting your answers. You might be wondering, do I simply memorize the climatic characteristics of each climatic type? Absolutely not! Instead, treat Topic 1 as an opportunity to connect your understanding of temperature, precipitation, and wind patterns to the geographical zones where each climate type occurs. By doing so, you'll gain a clearer grasp of why different countries experience different climatic conditions. Now, let's dive into the fundamental elements of climate. Let's start by exploring why air temperature varies across time, from place to place, and even at specific locations. Firstly, we see daily variations due to the Earth's rotation. During midday, when the sun is directly overhead, solar radiation is most intense, resulting in the highest temperatures. For example, in Singapore, midday temperatures can rise to around 31 to 33 degrees Celsius due to intense solar heating near the equator. As the Earth rotates and the area moves away from direct sunlight, temperatures drop by dawn to cooler levels of about 24 to 26 degrees Celsius. Over the course of a year, temperatures change due to the Earth's revolution around the sun and the tilt of its axis at 23.5 degrees. In June, the northern hemisphere tilts toward the sun, receiving more direct solar radiation, while the southern hemisphere receives less. In December, the reverse occurs. During March and September, neither hemisphere tilts towards the sun, resulting in more moderate temperatures globally. Air temperature also varies across different places on Earth. Latitude is one key factor. The closer a place is to the equator, the higher the solar angle of the sun, and therefore, the more concentrated solar radiation it receives. That's why countries like Singapore, near the equator, have higher average temperatures than places at higher latitudes like Beijing. Altitude is another important factor. The higher the altitude, the cooler it gets. This is because air pressure and density are lower at higher altitudes, reducing the ability to absorb and retain heat. For instance, Genting Highlands at 1,700 meters above sea level averages 21 degrees Celsius, while nearby lowland areas average about 32 degrees Celsius. Even at the same location, surface features can influence air temperature. Urban areas, with more dark surfaces like roads and buildings, absorb more heat than rural or vegetated areas. This is known as the urban heat island effect. In Singapore, temperatures in the CBD can be 2 degrees Celsius warmer than areas like McRitchie Reservoir, which has dense vegetation. Additionally, distance from the sea matters. Due to the different specific heat capacities of land and sea, where land heats up and cools down faster than the sea, coastal areas experience the maritime effect. As the sea moderates temperature fluctuations, 
coastal areas experience cooler summers and warmer winters as compared to inland areas. This gives rise to the varying annual temperature ranges between the coastal and inland areas of a location. So, turning to your examinations, you might be required to explain these variations using real examples or interpret graphs and diagrams. Be sure to revise and use geographical terminologies such as solar angle, maritime effect, and altitude when crafting your explanations. Now, let's unpack the next element of weather and climate, precipitation. Precipitation is closely linked to the water cycle. Water from the Earth's surface, including oceans, lakes, and plants, enters the atmosphere through evaporation and transpiration. As this water vapor rises, it cools, and upon reaching the dew point temperature, it condenses into tiny droplets around particles known as condensation nuclei. These droplets combine through coalescence, grow in size, and eventually fall as rain once they're heavy enough. The rate at which water moves through this cycle can vary based on several factors. One possible factor could be soil type. Sandy soil allows for faster infiltration, while clay soil slows it down. Urban areas with concrete surfaces limit infiltration and increase surface runoff. In contrast, vegetated areas slow down runoff and increase water absorption due to the presence of plant roots. There are also different types of rainfall. In convectional rainfall, common in tropical equatorial areas such as Singapore, the ground is intensely heated by the sun during the day. Warm air rises, cools, and condenses to form tall, towering cumulonimbus clouds, leading to short but intense thunderstorms. Next, we look at relief rainfall. Relief rainfall occurs when moist air is forced to rise over an elevated landform such as a mountain. As the moisture-laden air rises, it cools and condenses, producing rain on the windward side, while the leeward side remains dry. This phenomenon can be observed in places like the Hawaiian Islands of USA, as well as the Southern Alps on the South Island of New Zealand. Structured exam questions may ask you to explain cloud formation or describe the types of rainfall. A clear step-by-step -step explanation using key terms like dew point temperature, condensation, and coalescence is essential. Diagrams are common, so make sure you can label them accurately and describe what they show. Lastly, let's unpack the element of wind. Wind is the horizontal movement of air across the Earth's surface. It occurs due to differences in atmospheric pressure, which result from the uneven heating of the Earth during different times of the day and year. In warmer regions, air becomes less dense and rises, creating low pressure. In cooler regions, air becomes denser and sinks, creating high pressure. As air moves from areas of high to low pressure to balance out these differences, we experience wind. The speed of wind is influenced by the strength of the pressure gradient. The greater the difference in pressure between two areas, the stronger the wind. However, if there is friction with the Earth's surface, especially in areas with uneven topography like mountains or valleys, wind speed can slow down significantly. Now, let's observe the wind systems at different scales. On a local scale, we get land and sea breezes. At night, land cools faster than the sea, creating higher pressure over land. This results in a land breeze as wind moves out from land to sea. During the day, the opposite occurs. The land heats up faster, creating a sea breeze as wind moves from the sea to the land. On a regional scale, we get monsoon winds during specific times of the year, October to February, as well as June to September. During these periods, the northeast and southwest monsoons form. From October to February, the northern hemisphere experiences winter. The cold, dense air over Central Asia creates a region of higher pressure, while the warm, rising summer air in the southern hemisphere gives rise to a region of lower pressure. And since air moves from areas of high to low pressure, the general wind direction from October to February will be southerly, with winds moving towards areas such as Australia in the southern hemisphere. As the monsoon winds move across the hemispheres, the Coriolis effect comes into play to alter the direction of the winds. Due to the Earth's rotation, winds are deflected to its right in the northern hemisphere and to its left in the southern hemisphere. Combining this effect with general wind direction as mentioned above, we observe the unique path of northwest monsoon wind system. What's most interesting is the effects of wind on the rainfall pattern. As the monsoon winds move over large water bodies such as the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean, they pick up moisture and deposit them as monsoon rain onto parts of Southeast Asia, including Singapore, and parts of the Southern Hemisphere such as Northern Australia. 
However, you might notice that India and Bangladesh, located further north, receives little to no rainfall during this period. This is because the winds, originating from the cold and dry areas of Central Asia, have yet to pick up moisture from large water bodies. Thus, the dry air brings little to no monsoon rain when passing over this region. Next, the reversal of winds occur from June to September. During this period, the southwest monsoon takes place. The northern hemisphere experiences summer while the southern hemisphere experiences winter. Since the winds move northwards from the higher pressure region of Australia towards the lower pressure region of Central Asia, Coriolis effect deflects the winds, giving rise to the southwest monsoon. As the monsoon winds move across large water bodies such as the Indian Ocean, they pick up moisture and bringing intense rain to India, Bangladesh, and parts of Indonesia. What about Singapore? As most rain is deposited onto the windward side of mountains in Indonesia, Singapore receives lesser monsoon rainfall during this period. Understanding both wind direction and the impact on rainfall is key for exams. To excel, you must be able to label diagrams and describe the seasonal movement of air masses and the resulting climatic effects. Now that we have understood the different elements of weather and climate, let's review the key learning strategies. As you prepare for your exams, it's crucial to master the following concepts. The distinction between weather and climate, characteristics of different climate types, factors that affect temperature, the formation process of precipitation, and the causes of wind patterns at both local and regional scales. Practice interpreting diagrams such as climographs, rainfall formation cycles, and wind direction maps. Be precise with geographical terminologies. Real-life examples from Singapore, like convectional rainfall or temperature variation in urban zones, add depth and relevance to your answers. Highlighting these connections helps demonstrate applied geographical thinking. And there you have it, a full breakdown of Topic 1 of the Climate Cluster. You now understand the forces behind the daily weather you feel and the climate systems around the world. And if you would like more resources to enhance your learning of geography, Head to thatgeographyteacher.com and you'll find plenty of resources from Cluster Content Breakdown to my written guidebook, to articles that broaden your perspective on learning, as well as link to my custom AI tool. Hope you'll enjoy the process of learning and see you in the next video.